We reached a thousand subscribers. I don't know. I forgot to make a post on YouTube. For those of you in my Discord, I made a post in the Discord about it. Uh, I will be making a post to the YouTube. Uh, probably tonight after this live stream for the YouTube viewers. You would have seen it probably a couple days ago. Um, but we reached a thousand. We actually surpassed a thousand subscribers over on YouTube. We're now at 1037 the last time I looked. Um, uh, which was right before I went live. So, yay! <laughs> Next steps, that means I can apply for monetization of my channel, um, which if I get approved, I, I don't know if my channel will get approved. Um, it just depends on whoever is reviewing the request, what they decide uh, if my videos are up to the guidelines of YouTube. Um, <clears throat> so... The next step is applying for monetization. I don't know how long that'll take or if the channel will even get monetized. If it does get monetized, that does mean there will be ads on the YouTube videos. But like all other YouTube ads, most of the time you can just skip them. If not, they're very short. But that does help out any little income I can get right now is very helpful as I'm struggling to pay my own bills right now. Um due to some job switcherooing going on. Um, so any little money helps. And it also opens me up to the possibility of memberships because I know there are several YouTube viewers that have asked me how they can support financially when they don't have Twitch. So having a membership subscription would be nice. Also, um, I might start dual streaming one if I get monetized with the option of memberships. Because then, uh, essentially, dual streaming is streaming on two platforms at the exact same time. So I will stream over here on Twitch, and it will also simultaneously stream over on YouTube as well. Um, I didn't really want to do that as of late because it kind of discourages people from coming to my Twitch channel and subscribing uh, and following over here. Um, which is, you know my only source of income doing these streams slash videos right now so that is why i haven't wanted to dual stream until i get monetized on youtube if i get monetized on youtube also other point of business with the youtube side um as kind of a congrats celebration on hitting 1000 a friend of mine the same friend who makes my reading playlist, actually gave me an idea I could do. So I was thinking I'm, I'm, I'll probably see what the comment section of this video says um, of if we want to do that or not. But this friend gave me the idea of I also have written things myself. Not quite full novels, but little short stories and things back when I was in high school. Uh, some of them I'm very proud of. And so her idea was as a 1,000 1, subscriber special, I could r record myself, uh, whether I do it in the beginning of a, you know, our normal reading streams, whether I do it at the beginning of the next one, or just record a separate video of me reading some of my short stories. Um, won't take very long. Uh, and there's like a couple options of short stories that I could do. So depending on what the comments say, if the comments of this video turn out to be very positive of like, yes, read us some of your stuff. Um, like, yes, read us some of your stuff. Then I will probably post a poll over on YouTube saying, okay, would you like me to read these two short stories? Here's the title and what they're about. Or I did try to write a novel. I only got a few chapters in before life took over and I had to stop. Um, but I could read the the chapters I have written of that novel. There is no continu continuation of it at this point. Because if I were to ever revisit to finish writing it, I would want to rewrite the whole thing. Because uh, it was definitely very high school writing style. Um, and I feel like I've grown as a person since then. 
and that's kind of the only reason why I haven't gone back to finishing that novel. I think as a base idea, it was really cool. Um, but just the writing style is very, <laughs> is very high school. <laughs> um, writing stream when? I don't know if anybody would be interested in that. I'm just chilling with me while I flesh out backstories of characters and just writing. Um, but anyways, I should probably write down the timestamp of when I actually start reading the first chapter. So if somebody wants to skip over all of this mumbo jumbo stuff, they can. Which also means getting my notebook ready. I don't know if that's the page I'm on. This is the page I'm on. I know because it has one of my, how to pronounce one of the viewers' names on it. Yeah, viewers could give me input while I write, but then the other issue that would come into it is if I wanted it to be a full novel, I would be afraid of somebody stealing my idea or my work. If that makes sense. Which I don't think, I don't think I would be that. I'm not that pressed on it. I mean, I think the idea is somewhat unique. Um. But you know, whatever. Um. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much. Okay. So, uh, back to this stuff. We are, we left off. Let me look. This one says 23. This one says 24. Okay, so we left off with Tower of Dawn. Um, they did get me thinking. They did get me. Also, I'll silence my watch because that's going to drive me fucking crazy this entire time. <clears throat> okay. <sighs> Also, I've been very itchy, and don't worry, the redness, I'm not injured, I'm just very pale, so whenever I scratch my skin, it gets red. I'm just a vampire, so that's what that means. I just, I saw it on camera, and I had to point it out, just like you can see, like, all my fucking veins and shit. I'm not ill. That's just how I be. I mean, I'm ill. <laughs> but, it, it, and, <laughs> mentally and physically, but that's besides the point. Um, yes, please be nice, mother. Please love be nice. You. I love you too. <laughs> but with that, let's get our reading playlist on because I've just been listening to my normal stream playlist. I'm also a vampire. I just need fangs. So true. When I was a kid, I did have fangs because I lost these two teeth. And so only the fangs were showing. And uh, I used to run around the the, the, the playground biting people uh, when I was a kid. To be fair, they asked for it. We were playing vampires. I was like 10 or 11. I didn't bite them that hard. I never got in trouble for it, so. I like because your mother didn't know you were biting people. The, the, the staff didn't know I was biting people because I didn't bite people that hard. I didn't leave any marks. Anyways. Anyways. <clears throat> we left off with chapter 10 of Tower of Dawn. As always, here is the guide for reference. So we left off with Tower of Dawn chapter 10, so we're going to read chapter 10, and then we're going to switch over to Empire Storms for a few chapters. Um, I don't know if we'll get back to Tower of Dawn, it depends on how long these chapters are. <clears throat> Let me know if music is too loud at any point. <clears throat> Also, I did eat, like, two pickles before stream, and my throat's kind of weird. I mean, as it always is, like, 24-7, but... It just feels a little weird. Also, I had gluten, which could also contribute to that. <clears throat> okay. 
10, we're going to write down 10 minutes even for starting of chapter 10 of Tower of Dawn. <clears throat> hold on. I'm just, hold on. Hold on. I'm not comfortable. I need to like figure out a way to sit at this desk and be comfortable. Oh, it's because my keyboard's not up all the way. That's, that, okay. There we go. We're good now. I'm just going to slouch a shit ton when I do reading streams, and that's because holding my head downward for too long hurts my neck. Anyways. <clears throat> Chapter 10 of Tower of Dawn. A summer storm galloped in off the narrow sea just before midnight. Even tucked into the sprawling library at the base of the Torre, Irene felt every shudder of thunder. Occasional flashes of lightning sliced down the narrow corridors of the stacks and halls, chased by wind that crept through the cracks in the pale stone, guttering the candles in its wake. Most were shielded within glass lanterns, the books and scrolls too precious to risk open flame. But the wind found them in there, too and set the glass lanterns hanging from the arched ceiling swinging and groaning. Seated at an oak desk built into an alcove far from the brighter lights and busier areas of the library, Irene watched the, mental, the metal lanterns dangling from the arch above her sway in the storm wind. Stars and crescent moons had been cut from its sides and filled with colored glass that cast splotches of blue and red and green on the stone wall before her. The splotches bobbed and dipped, a living sea of color. Thunder cracked, so loud she flinched, the ancient chair beneath her creaking in objection. A few feminine yelps answered it, then giggles. Acolytes, studying late for their examinations this week. Irene huffed a laugh, mostly at herself, and shook her head as she focused again upon the texts Nanusha had dug up for her hours ago. Irene and the head librarian had never been close, and Irene was certainly not inclined to seek out the woman if she spotted her in the mess hall, but... Nusha was fluent in fifteen languages, some of them dead, and had trained at the famed Parvani Library at the western coast. Nestled amid the lush and spice-rich lands outside Balrun. The city of libraries, they called Balrun. If the Torre Chesme was the domain of healers, the Parvani was the domain of knowledge. Even the great road that linked Balarun to the mighty Sister Road, the main artery through the continent that flowed from Antica all the way to Dagana, and had been named for it. The Scholar's Road. Irene didn't know what had brought Nusha here all those decades ago, or what the Torre had offered her to stay, but she was an invaluable resource, and for all of her unsmiling nature, Nusha had always found Irene the information she needed, no matter how outlandish the request. Tonight, the woman had not looked pleased when Irene had approached her in the mess hall, apologies falling from her lips for interrupting the librarian's meal. Irene might have waited until the morning, but she had lessons tomorrow, and Lord Westfall after that. Nusha had met Irene here after finishing her meal and had listened, long fingers folded in front of her flowing gray robes, to Irene's story, and needs, information, any she could find, wounds from demons, wounds from dark magic, wounds from unnatural sources, wounds that left echoes but not, did not appear to continue to wreak havoc upon the victim, wounds that left marks but no scar tissue. Nusha had found them, stack after stack of books and bundles of scrolls. She piled them on the desk in silence. Some were in Halha, some in Irene's own tongue, some in Eelwe, some were. Irene scratched her head at the scroll she'd weighted with the smooth onyx stones from the jar set on each library desk. Even Nusha had admitted she did not recognize the strange markings, runes of some sort. From where, she had no inkling either, only that the scrolls had been wedged beside the Eelwe tomes and a level of the library so deep beneath the ground that Irene had never ventured there. Irene ran a finger over the markings before her, tracing its straight lines and curving arcs. The parchment was old enough that Nusha had threatened to flay Irene alive if she got any food, water, or drink on it. When Irene had asked just how old, 
Lucia had shook her head. A hundred years? Irene had asked. Nusha had shrugged and said that judging by the location, the type of parchment, and ink pigment, it was over ten times that. Irene cringed at the paper she was so flagrantly touching and eased the waiting stones off the corners. None of the books in her own language had yielded anything valuable. More old wives' warnings about ill-wishers and spirits of air and rot. Nothing like what Lord Westfall had described. A faint, distant click echoed from the gloom to her right, and Irene lifted her head, scanning the darkness, ready to leap onto her chair at the first sign of a scurrying mouse. It seemed even the library's beloved Bast cats, 36 females, no more, no less, could not keep out all vermin, despite their warrior goddess namesake. Irene again scanned the gloom to her right, cringing, wishing she could summon one of the barrel-eyed cats to go hunting. But no one summoned a Bast cat. No one. They appeared when, they when and where they willed, and not a moment before. The Bast cats had dwelled in the Torre library for as long as it had existed, yet not n none knew where they had come from, or how they were replaced when age claimed them. Each was an individual as any human, save for those barrel-colored eyes they each bore, and the fact that all were just as prone to curl up in a lap as they were to shun company altogether. Some of the healers, old and young alike, swore the cats could step through pools of shadow to appear on another level of the library. Some swore the cats had been caught pawing through the pages of open books. Reading. Well, it'd certainly be helpful if they bothered to read less and hunt more. But the cats answered to no one and nothing, except, perhaps, their namesake. Or whatever god had found quiet, a quiet home in the library, within Silba's shadow. To offend one bast cat was to insult them all. And even though Irene loved most animals, with the exception of some insects... She had been sure to treat the cats kindly, occasionally leaving morsels of food or providing a belly rub or ear scratch whenever they deigned to command them. But there was no sign of those green eyes glinting in the dark, or of a scurrying mouse fleeing their path. So Irene loosed a breath and set aside the ancient scroll, carefully placing it at the edge of the desk before pulling an eelway tome toward her. The book was bound in black leather, heavy as a doorstop. She knew a little of the Eelway language thanks to living so close to its border with a mother who spoke it fluently. Certainly not from the father who had hailed from there. None of the Tower's women had ever married, preferring either lovers who left them with a present that arrived nine months later, or who perhaps stayed a year or two before moving on. Irene had never known her father, never learned anything about who he was other than a traveler who had stopped at her mother's cottage for the night seeking shelter from a wild storm that swept over the grassy plain. Irene traced her fingers over the gilt title, <clears throat> sounding out the words in the language she had not spoken or heard in years. The. The. She tapped her finger on the title. She should have asked Nusha. The librarian had already promised to translate some other text that had caught her eye, but Irene sighed again. The poem? Ode? Lyric? Song, she breathed. The song of... Start? Onset? Beginning. The song of beginning. The demons, the Volg, were ancient, Lord Westfall had said. They had waited an eternity to strike, part of near-forgotten myths, little more than bedside stories. Irene flipped open the cover and cringed at the unfamiliar tangle of writing within the table of contents. The type itself was old, the book not even printed on a press. Handwritten, with some word variations that had long since died out. Lightning flashed again and Irene rubbed at her temple as she leafed through the musty, yellow-lined pages. A history book. That's all it was. Her eyes snagged on a page and she paused, backtracking until the illustration had reappeared. It had been done in sparing colors, blacks, whites, reds, and the occasional yellow, all painted by a master's hand, no doubt an illustration of whatever was written beneath it. The illustration revealed a barren crag, an army of soldiers in dark armor kneeling before it. Kneeling before what was 
atop the crag. A towering gate, no wall flanking it, no keep behind it, as if someone had built the gateway of black stone out of thin air. There were no doors within the archway, only swirling black nothing. Beams of it shot from the void, some foul corruption of the sun, falling upon the soldiers kneeling before it. She squinted at the figures in the foreground. Their bodies were human, but the hands clutching their swords clawed, twisted. Balg, Irene whispered. Thunder cracked in answer. Irene scowled at the swaying lantern as the reverberations from the thunderhead rumbled beneath her feet, up her legs. She flipped through the pages until the next illustration appeared. Three figures stood before the same gate, the drawing too distant to make out any features beyond their male bodies, tall and powerful. She ran a finger over the caption below and translated, Orcus, Mantix, Erewhon, three Volg kings, wielders of the keys. Irene chewed on her bottom lip. Lord Westfall had not mentioned such things. But if there was a gate, then it would need a key to open it. Or several. If the book was correct. Midnight chimed in the great clock of the library's main atrium. Irene rifled through the pages to another illustration. It was divided into three panels. Everything the Lord had said. She had believed him, of course, but it was true. If the wound wasn't proof enough, these texts offered no other alternative. For there in the first panel, tied down upon an altar of dark stone, a desperate young man strained to free himself from the approach of a crowned dark figure. Something swirled around the figure's hand, some asp of black mist and wicked thought. No real creature. The second panel. Irene cringed from it. For there was that young man, eyes wide in supplication and terror, mouth forced open as that creature of black mist slithered down its throat. But it was the last panel that made her blood chill. Lightning flashed again, illuminating the final illustration. The young man's face had gone still, unfeeling. His eyes. Irene glanced between the previous drawing and the final one. His eyes had been silver in the first two. In the final one, they had gone black. Passable as human eyes, but the silver had been wiped away by unholy obsidian. Not dead, for they had shown him rising, chains removed. Not a threat. No, whatever they put inside him. Thunder groaned again, and more shrieks and giggles followed, along with the slam and clatter of the acolytes leaving for the night. Irene surveyed the book before her. The other stacks Nusha had laid out. Lord Westfall had described collars and rings to hold the Volg demons within a human host. But even after they were removed, he'd said, they could linger. They were merely implantation devices, and if they remained on too long, feeding off their host... Irene shook her head. The man in the drawing had not been enslaved. He'd been infested. The magic had come from someone with that sort of power. Power from the demon host within. A clash of lightning, then thunder immediately on its heels. And then another click sounded, faint and hollow, from the dim stacks to her right, closer now than that earlier one had been. Irene glanced again toward the gloom, the hair on her arms rising, not a movement of a mouse, or even the scrape of feline claws on stone or bookshelf. She had never once feared for her safety, not from the moment she had set foot within these walls. But Irene found herself going still as she stared into that gloom to her right, then slowly looked over her shoulder. The shelf-lined corridor was a straight shot toward a larger hallway, which would, in three minutes' walk, take her back to the bright, constantly monitored main atrium. Five minutes at most. Only shadows and leather and dust surrounded her, the light bobbing and tilting with the swaying lanterns. Healing magic offered no defenses. She discovered such things the hard way. But during that year at the White Pig Inn, she'd learned to listen. Learned to read a room. 
to sense when the air had shifted. Men could unleash storms, too. The grumbling echo of the thunder faded, and only silence remained in its wake. Silence, and the creaking of the ancient lanterns in the wind. No other click issued. Foolish. Foolish to read such things so late, and during a storm. Irene swallowed. Librarians preferred the books remain within the library popper, proper, but... She slammed shut the song of beginning, shoving it into her bag. Most of the books she'd already deemed useless, but there were perhaps six more, a mixture of Eelway and other tongues. Irene shoved those into her bag, too, and gently placed the scrolls into the pockets of her cloak, tucked out of view. All while keeping one eye over her shoulder, on the hall behind her, the stacks to her right. You wouldn't owe me anything if you'd used some common sense, the young stranger had snapped that, at her that fateful night. After she'd saved Irene's life. The words had lingered, biting deep, as had the other lessons she'd been taught by that girl. And though Irene knew she'd laugh at herself in the morning, though maybe it was one of the bast cats stalking something in the shadows, Irene decided to listen to that tug of fear that trickled down her spine. Though she could have cut down dark stacks to reach the main hallway faster, she kept to the lights, her shoulders back and head high, just as the girl had told her. Look like you'd put up a fight. Be more trouble than you're worth. Her heart pounded so wildly she could feel it in her arms, her throat. But Irene made her mouth a hard line, her eyes bright and cold, looking as furious as she'd ever been, her pace clipped and swift, as if she had forgotten something or someone had failed to retrieve a book for her. Closer and closer, she neared the intersection of that broad main hallway to where the acolytes would be trudging up to bed in their cozy dormitory. She cleared her throat, readying to scream. Not rape, not theft, not something that cowards would rather hide from. Yell fire, the stranger had instructed her. A threat to all. If you are attacked, yell about a fire. Irene had repeated the instructions so many times these past two and a half years, to so many women, just as the stranger had ordered her to. Irene had not thought she'd ever again need to recite them for herself. Irene hurried her steps, jaw angled. She had no weapon save for a small knife she used for cleaning out wounds or cutting bandages, currently in the bottom of her bag. But that satchel, laden with books... She wrapped the leather straps around her wrist, getting a good grip on it. A well-placed swing would knock someone to the ground. Closer and closer to the safety of that hallway. From the corner of her eye, she saw it. Sensed it. Someone in the next stack over, walking parallel to her. She didn't dare look. Acknowledge it. Irene's eyes burned even as she fought the terror that clawed its way up her body. Glimpses of shadows and darkness stalking her, hunting her, quickening its pace to grab her, cut her off at that hallway and snatch her into the dark. Common sense. Common sense. Running. It would know. It would know she was aware. It might strike whoever it was. Common sense. A hundred feet left until the hallway, shadows pooling between the dim lanterns, the lights now precious islands in a sea of darkness. She could have sworn fingers lightly thudded as they trailed over the books on the other side of the shelf. So Irene lifted her chin farther and smiled, laughing brightly as she looked ahead to the hallway. Madya, what are you doing here so late? She hurried her pace, especially as whoever it was slowed in surprise. Hesitation. Irene's foot slammed into something soft. Soft and yet hard, and she bit down her yelp. She hadn't seen the healer curled on her side in the shadows along the shelf. Irene bent, hands grappling for the women's thin arms. Her build slender enough that when she turned her over, the footsteps began once more just as she turned the healer over, as she swallowed the scream that tried to shatter out of her. Light brown cheeks turned to hollowed husks, eyes stained purple beneath, lips pale and cracked. A simple healer's gown that had likely fit her that morning now hung loose, her slim form now emaciated, as if something had sucked the life from her. 
She knew that face, gaunt as it was, knew the golden brown hair, nearly the twin to her own, the healer from the womb, the very one she'd comforted only hours earlier. Irene's fingers shook as she fumbled for a pulse, the skin leathery and dry. Nothing. And her magic? There was no life for it to swirl toward. No life at all. The footsteps on the other side of the stack neared. Irene stood on trembling knees, taking a steadying breath as she forced herself to walk again. Forced herself to leave that dead healer in the dark. Forced herself to lift her bag as if nothing had happened, as if showing the satchel to someone ahead. But with the angle of the stacks, the person didn't know that. Just finishing up my reading for the night, she called to her invisible salvation ahead. She sent up a silent prayer of thanks to Silva that her voice held steady in Mary. Cook is expecting me for a last cup of tea. Want to join? Making it seem like someone was expecting her. Another trick she'd picked up. Irene cleared five more steps before she realized whoever it was had again halted, buying her ruse. Irene dashed the last few feet to the hallway, spotted a cluster of acolytes just emerging from another haze of stacks and hurtled flat out toward them. Their eyes widened at Irene's approach, and all she whispered was, Go! The three girls, barely more than fourteen, caught the tears of terror in her eyes, the sure witness of her face, the sure whiteness of her face, and did not look behind Irene. They did not disobey. They were in her class. She'd trained them for months now. They saw the straps of her satchel wrapped around her fist and closed ranks around her. Smiled broadly, nothing at all wrong. Come to Cook's to get tea, Irene told them, fighting to keep her scream from shattering out of her. Dead. A healer was dead. She is expecting me. And will raise the alarm if I do not arrive. To their credit, those girls did not tremble, did not show one lick of dread as they walked down the main hall. As they neared the atrium, with its roaring fire and 36 chandeliers and 36 couches and chairs. A sleek black bass cat was lounging in one of those embroidered chairs by the fire, and as they neared, she leapt, leaped up, hissing as fiercely as her feline head name, headed namesake. Not on Irene or the girls. No, those barrel-colored eyes were narrowed at the library behind them. One of the girls tightened her grip on Irene's arm, but not one of them left Irene's side as she approached the massive desk of the head librarian and her heir. Behind them, the bass cat held her ground, held the line as the heir librarian on duty for the night looked up from her book at the commotion. Irene murmured to the middle-aged woman in gray robes, A healer has been gravely attacked in the stacks off the main hall. Get everyone out and call for the royal guard now. The woman did not ask questions, did not falter or shake. She only nodded before she reached for the bell, bolted onto the desk's edge. The librarian rang it thrice. To an outsider, it was no more than a final call. But to those who lived here, who knew the library was open day and night, first ring, listen. Second, listen now. The air librarian rang it a third time, loud and clear, the pealing echoing down into the library, into every dark corner and hallway. Third uh, ring. Get out. Irene had once asked, when Arisha had explained the warning bell her first day here, after she had taken a vow to never repeat its meaning to an outsider. They all had. And Irene had asked why it was needed. Who had installed it? Long ago, before the Kaganate had conquered Antica, this city had passed from hand to hand, victim to a dozen conquests and rulers. Some invading arm armies had been kind. A few had not. Tunnels still existed beneath the library that they had used to evade them, long since boarded up. But the warning bell to those within remained, and for a thousand years the Torre had kept it, occasionally had drills with it, just in case if it should ever happen. The third ring echoed off stone and leather and wood, and Irene could have sworn she heard the sound of countless heads popping up from where they bent over desks, heard the sound of chairs shoved back and books dropped. Run, she begged. Keep to the lights. 
But Irene and the others lingered in silence, counting the seconds. The minutes. The bast cat quieted her hissing and monitored the hall beyond the atrium, black tail slashing over the chair cushion. One of the girls beside Irene sprinted off to the guards by the Torre gates, who had likely heard the bell pealing and were already running toward them. Irene was shaking by the time quick steps and rustling clothing drew near. She and the air librarian marked each face that emerged, each wide-eyed face that hurried out of the library. Acolytes, healers, librarians, no one out of place. The bast cat seemed to be checking them all, too, those barrel eyes seeing things perhaps beyond Irene's comprehension. Armor and stomping steps, and Irene clamped down on the weeping relief at the approach of half a dozen Torre guards, now stalking through the open library doors, the acolyte at their heels. The acolyte and her two companions remained with Irene while she explained, while the guards called for reinforcements, while the air librarian summoned Nusha, Arisha, and Hafiza. The three girls remained, two holding Irene's trembling hands. They did not let go. And that was chapter 10 of Tower of Dawn. Ooh. Ellie MKP, thank you for the follow. Yeah, it's very intense. Oh, and uh, it is like insinuated that this the scroll with symbols on it is word marks. Like, if that wasn't clear, it's definitely word marks. Like, that's very clear. That's what I was guessing. Yeah. Yeah, no, she did good. She did good. Irene, Irene's a badass. Irene's a badass. She's secretly a badass. I mean, you guys know that just from what they've said in this book and then also the the uh the assassin's blade part the the assassin and the healer <clears throat> uh for the next chapter we are switching over to empire of storms so if you guys are reading along get out your empire of storms book and turn to if i can open my book without losing the chapter uh chapter 14 I'm going to take one more drink of water. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> On to chapter 14. Also, before I start that, hi Lilith. I didn't say hi to you earlier, but hello Lilith. Clothed in battle black from head to toe, Adi and Ash River kept to the shadows of the street across from the temple and watched his cousin scale the building beside him. They'd already secured passage on a ship for tomorrow morning, along with another messenger ship to sail to Wendelin bearing letters beseeching the Ash Rivers for aid, and signed by both Aelin and Adian himself. Because what they'd learned today. He'd been to Ilium enough times over the past decade to know his way around. Usually he and his bane had camped outside the town walls and enjoyed themselves so thoroughly at the taverns that he'd wound up puking in his own helmet the next morning. A far cry from the stunned silence as he and Aelin had walked down the pale, dusty streets, disguised and unsociable. In all those visits to the town, he'd never imagined tra traversing these streets with his queen, or that her face would be so grave as she took in the frightened, unhappy people, the scars of war. No flowers thrown in their path, no trumpets singing their return, just the crash of the sea, the howl of the wind, and the beating sun overhead and the rage rippling off Aelin at the sight of the soldiers stationed around the town. All strangers were watched enough that they'd had to be careful about securing their ship. To the town, 
the world, they'd be boarding the Summer Lady at mid-morning, heading south, heading north to Syria. But they would instead be sneaking onto the Windsinger just before sunrise to sail south from dawn. They'd paid in gold for the captain's silence. And for his information. They had been about to leave the man's cabin when he'd said, My brother is a merchant. He specializes in goods from distant lands. He brought me news last week that ships were spotted rallying along the western coast of the Fey territory. Aelin had asked, To sail here? At the same time, Adian had demanded, How many ships? Fifty, all warships, the captain had said, looking them over carefully, no doubt assuming they were agents of one of the many crowns at play in this war. An army of fey warriors camped on the beach beyond. They seemed to be waiting for the order to sail. The news would likely spread fast, panic the people. Adian had made a note to send warning to a second to brace the bane for it and counter any wild rumors. Aelin's face had gone a bit bloodless, and he braced a steadying hand between her shoulder blades. But she had only stood straighter at his touch and asked the captain, Did your brother get the sense that Queen Maeve has allied with Morath, or that she is coming to assist Terrison? Neither, the captain had cut in. He was only sailing past. Though if the Armada was out like that, I doubt it was secret. We know nothing else. Perhaps the ships were for another war. His queen's face yielded nothing in the dimness of her hood. Adian made his do the same. Except her face had remained like that the entire walk back, and in the hour since, when they'd honed their weapons and then slipped back onto the streets under the cover of darkness. If Maeve was indeed rallying an army to stand against them. Aelin paused atop the roof, Goldrin's bright hilt wrapped in cloth to hide its gleaming. An Adian glanced between her shadowy figure and the Adderlin watch patrolling the temple walls near feet of below. But his cousin turned her head toward the nearby ocean, as if she could see all the way to Maeve and her awaiting fleet. If the immortal bitch allied with Morath, surely Maeve would not be so stupid. Perhaps the two dark rulers would destroy each other in their bid for power and likely destroy this continent in the process. But a dark king and a dark queen united against the Firebringer? They had to act quickly, cut off one snake's head before dealing with the other. Cloth on skin hissed, and Adian glanced at where Lysandra waited behind him, on the lookout for Aelin's signal. She was in her traveling clothes, a bit worn and dirty. She'd been reading an ancient-looking book all afternoon. Forgotten Creatures of the Deep or whatever it had been called. A smile tugged at his lips as he wondered whether, he'd, whether she'd borrowed or stolen the title. The lady looked to where Aelin still stood on the roof, no more than a shadow. Lysandra cleared her throat a bit and said too softly for anyone to hear, either the queen or the soldiers across the street. She's accepted Darrow's decree too calmly. I'd hardly call any of this calm. But he knew what the shifter meant. Since Rowan had gone... Since word of Rifthold's fall had arrived, Aelin had been half-present, distant. Lysandra's pale green eyes pinned him to the spot. It's the calm before the storm, Adian. Every one of his predatory instincts perked. Lysandra's eyes again drifted to Aelin's lithe figure. A storm is coming. A great storm. Not the forces lurking in Morath. Not Darrow plotting in Orinth or Maeve assembling her armada, but the woman on that roof, hands braced on the edge as she crouched down. You're not frightened of... He couldn't say the rest. He'd somehow grown accustomed to having the shifter guard Aelin's back, had found the idea mighty appealing. Rowan at her right, Adian at her left, Lysandra at her back. Nothing and no one would get to their queen. No, no, never, Lysandra said. Something eased in his chest. But the more I think about it, the more, the more it seems like this was all planned, laid out long ago. Erewhon had decades before Aelin was born to strike, decades during which no one with her powers, or Dorian's powers, existed to challenge him. Yet as fate or fortune would have it, he moves now, at a time when a firebringer walks the earth. What are you getting at? He'd considered all this before, during those long watches on the road. It was all horrifying, 
impossible, but so much of their lives defied logic or normalcy. The shifter next to him proved that. Morath is unleashing its horrors, Lysandra said. Maeve stirs across the sea. Two goddesses walk hand in hand with Aelin. More than that, Mala and Deanna have watched over her the entirety of her life. But perhaps it wasn't watching. Perhaps it was shaping. So they might one day unleash her, too. And I wonder if the gods have weighed the costs of that storm and deemed the casualties worth it. A chill snaked down his spine. Lysandra went on, so quietly that Adian wondered if she feared not the queen hearing, but those gods. We have yet to see the full extent of Erewhon's darkness, and I think we have yet to see the full extent of Aelin's fire. She's not some unwitting pawn. He'd defy the gods, find a way to slaughter them, if they threatened Daelin, if they deemed these lands a worthy sacrifice to defeat the Dark King. Is it really that hard for you to just agree with me for once? I never disagree. You always have an answer to everything. She shook her head. It's unsufferable. Adian grinned. Good to know I'm finally getting under your skin. Or is it skins? That staggeringly beautiful face turned positively wicked. Careful, Adian. I bite. Adian leaned in a bit closer. He knew there were lines with Lysandra. Knew there were boundaries he wouldn't cross, wouldn't push at. Not after what she'd endured since childhood. Not after she'd regained her freedom. Not after what he'd been through, too. Even if he hadn't told Aelin about it. How could he? How could he explain what had been done to him? What he'd been forced to do in those early years of conquest? But flirting with Lysandra was harmless. For both him and the shifter. And gods, it was good to talk to her for more than a minute between forms. So he snapped his teeth at her and said, Good thing I know how to make a woman purr. She laughed softly, but the sound died as she looked toward their queen again, the sea breeze shifting her dark silken hair. Any minute now, she warned him. Adian didn't give a shit what Darrow thought, what he sneered about. Lysandra had saved his life, had fought for their queen, and put everything on the line, including her ward, to rescue him from execution and reunite him with Aelin. He'd seen how often the shifter's eyes had darted behind them the first few days, as if she could see Evangeline with Murtog and Wren. He knew even now part of her remained with the girl, just as part of Aelin remained with Rowan. He wondered if he'd ever feel it, that degree of love. For Aelin, yes, but it was a part of him, as his limbs were a part of him. It had never been a choice, as Lysandra's selflessness with that little girl had been, as Rowan and Aelin had chosen each other. Perhaps it was stupid to consider, given what he'd been trained to do and what awaited them in Morath, but... He'd never tell her this in a thousand years, but looking at Aelin and Rowan, he sometimes envied them. He didn't even want to think about what else Darrow had implied, that a union between Wendelin and Terrison had been attempted over ten years ago, with the marriage between him and Aelin the asking price, only to be rejected by their kin across the sea. He loved his cousin, but the thought of touching her like that made his stomach turn. He had a feeling she returned the sentiment. She hadn't shown him the letter she'd written to Wendelin. It hadn't occurred to him until now to ask to see it. Adian stared up at the lone figure before the vast, dark sea, and realized he didn't want to know. He was a general, a warrior honed by blood and rage and loss. He had seen and done things that still drew him from his sleep, night after night, but he did not want to know. Not yet. Lysandra said, We should leave before dawn. I don't like the smell of this place. He inclined his head toward the fifty soldiers camped inside the temple walls. Obviously. But before she could speak, blue flames sparkled at Aelin's fingertips. The signal. Lysandra shifted into a ghost leopard, and Adian faded into the shadows as she loosed a roar that set the nearby homes tumbling awake. People spilled out of their doors just as the soldiers threw open the gates to the temple to see what the commotion was about. 
Aelin was off the roof in a few nimble maneuvers, landing with feline grace as the soldiers shoved into the street, weapons out, and eyes wide. Those eyes grew wider as Lysandra slunk up beside Aelin, snarling, as Adian fell into step on her other side. Together, they pulled off their hoods. Someone gasped behind them. Not at their golden hair, their faces, but at the hand wreathed in blue flame as Aelin lifted it above her head and said to the soldiers, pointing a crossbows at them, Get the hell out of my temple. The soldiers blinked. One of the townsfolk began, behind them began weeping as a crown of fire appeared atop Aelin's hair. As the cloth smothering gold ring burned away and the ruby glowed blood red. Adian smiled at the Adderlanian bastards, unhooked his shield from across his back, and said, My lady gives you a choice. Leave now, or never leave at all. The soldiers exchanged glances. The flame around Aelin's head burned brighter, a beacon in the dark. Symbols have power indeed. There she was, crowned in flame, a bastion against the gathered night. So Adian drew the Sword of Orinth from its sheath along his spine. Someone cried out at the sight of that ancient, mighty blade. More and more soldiers filled the open temple courtyard beyond the gate, and some dropped their weapons outright, lifting their hands, backing away. You bleeding cowards! A soldier snarled, shoving to the front. A commander from the decorations on his red and gold uniform. Human. No black rings on any of them. His lip curled as he beheld Adian, the shield and sword he angled, and ready for bloodletting. The wolf of the north, the sneer deepened, and the fire-breathing bitch herself. Aelin, to her credit, only looked bored, and she said one last time to the human soldiers gathered there, shifting on their feet. Live or die, it's your choice, but make it now. Don't listen to the bitch, the commander snapped. Simple parlor tricks, Lord Maya said. But five more soldiers dropped their weapons and ran. Outright sprinted into the streets. Anyone else? Aelin asked softly. Thirty-five soldiers remained. Weapons out, faces hard. Adian had fought against and alongside such men. Aelin looked to him in question. Adian nodded. The commander had his claws in them. They would only retreat when the man did. Come on, then. Let's see what you have to offer, the commander taunted. I've got a lovely, lovely farmer's daughter I want to finish. As if she were blowing out a candle, Aelin exhaled a breath toward the man. The first, the commander went quiet, as if every thought, every feeling had halted. Then his body seemed to stiffen, like he'd been turned to stone. And for a heartbeat... Adian thought the man had been turned to stone, as his skin, his Adelanian uniform, turned varying shades of gray. But as the sea breeze brushed past, and the man simply fell apart into nothing but ashes, Adian realized with no small amount of shock what she had done. She'd burned him alive, from the inside out. Someone screamed. Aelin merely said, I warned you. A few soldiers now bolted, but most held their ground, hate and disgust shining in their eyes at the magic, at his queen, at him. And Adian smiled like the wolf he was as he lifted the Sword of Orinth and unleashed himself upon the line of soldiers raising weapons on the left, Lysandra lunging to the right with a guttural snarl, and Aelin rained down flames of gold and ruby upon the world. They took back the temple in 20 minutes. It was only 10 before they had control of it. The soldiers either dead, or if they'd surrendered, hauled to the town dungeon by the men and women who had joined the fight. The other 10 minutes were spent scouring the place for any ambushers, but they found only their trappings and refuse, and the sight of the temple in such disrepair, the sacred walls carved with the names of Adelanian brutes, the ancient urns of never-ending fire extinguished or used for chamber pots. Aelin had let them all see when she sent the raising fire through the place, gobbling up any traces of those soldiers, 
removing years of dirt and dust and gold droppings to reveal the glorious ancient carvings beneath, etched into every pillar and step and wall. The temple complex comprised three buildings around a massive courtyard. The archives, the residence for the long-dead priestesses, and the temple proper, where the ancient rock was held. It was in the archives, the most defensible area by far, that she left Adian and Lysandra to find anything suitable for bedding, a wall of flame now encompassing the entire site. Adian's eyes still shone with the thrill of battle when she clamped <clears throat> when she claimed she wanted a moment alone by the rock. He'd fought beautifully, and she'd made sure to leave some men alive for him to take down. She was not the only symbol here tonight, not the only one watched. And as for the shifter who had ripped into those soldiers with such feral savagery, Aelin left her again in falcon form, perched on a rotting beam in the cavernous archives, staring at the enormous rendering of a sea dragon carved into the floor at last revealed by that raising fire, one of many similar carvings throughout, the heritage of a people long since exiled. From every space inside the temple, the crashing of waves on the shore far below whispered or roared. There was nothing to absorb the sound, to soften it. Great sprawling rooms and courtyards where there should have been altars and statues and gardens of reflection were wholly empty, the smoke of her fire still lingering good. Fire could destroy, but also cleanse. She crept across the darkened temple complex grounds to where the innermost, holiest of sanctuaries sprawled to the lip of the sea. Golden light leaked onto the rocky ground before the inner sanctum steps, light from the now eternally burning vats of flame to honor Brannon's gift. Still clothed in black, Aelin was little more than a shadow as she dimmed those fires to sleepy, murmuring embers and entered the heart of the temple. A great sea wall had been built to push back the wrath of storms from the stone itself. But even then, the space was damp, the air thick with brine. Aelin cleared the massive antechamber and strode between the two fat pillars that framed the inner sanctuary. At its far end, open to the wrath of the sea beyond, arose the massive black rock. It was smooth as glass, no doubt from the reverent hands that had touched it over the millennia and perhaps as big as a farmer's market wagon. It jutted upward, overhanging the sea, and starlight bounced off its pocked surface as Aelin extinguished every flame but the sole white candle fluttering in the center of the rock. The temple carvings revealed no word marks or further messages from the little folk, just swirls and stags. She'd have to do this the old-fashioned way, then. Aelin mounted the small stairs that allowed pilgrims to graze upon the sacred rock, then stepped on it to it. And that was chapter 14 of Empire of Storms. I don't know why every time I read aloud for reading streams, my nose gets stuffy. I think it's because like I stop breathing through my nose when I'm stream when I do reading streams. It does. It does make it look like I have cat ears, even though it's just my just my pillow. Oh, stretch break while my mom goes to the bathroom. Ooh, maybe I can crack my back. Oh, that was a good cop. What plushie would you like, Lilith? Ooh. What plushie would you like? I can't start reading the next chapter until you tell me. <laughs> The one that would wield fire. Ooh. 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 Honestly, I, I have one. Yes. I have one that wields fire. Yes. I have a toothless Build-A-Bear. 
Uh, yes, he is wearing a Moana costume. I like making Build-A-Bears and putting them in things that shouldn't fit them. Uh, so we've got Toothless in a Moana costume. I will perch him right here. Uh, cause I also have a- I also have an owl, um, Build-A-Bear that wears little, like, jean shorts and, uh, and a ball cap. He's got a little foam finger on his wing. I, I called him, he's named Sky Daddy. Um, cause when I put, when I squeezed his, his, his booty into the little jean shorts, uh, it made him look like kind of buffer. And I was like, why does he look like, like a, like a, like a sports dad? You know, like the dad that's at the sideline of his kids games going, woo! Yeah. So we named him Sky Daddy because he flies. So he's Sky daddy anyways um not important not important to the stream but here's the plushie that you demand toothless in a moana costume which it did take a lot of work to put him in this like i fear if i took this off of him i would never get it back on i don't even know if i could get it off of him at this point it he he's he's moana he he lives in this now <clears throat> um did I write I did not. Uh, pen. It is, it is important to La Fondalore. It sure is. Hmm. It makes me want to go to Build-A-Bear again. <laughs> the Build-A-Bear is really expensive. I don't remember it being that expensive when I was a kid. Maybe it's because I was a kid and I wasn't paying for it. Yes. And because but, you were a kid and not paying for it. Okay. So yes, build a bear expensive. is so expensive. Like, dude, I have been more in my adult life than I have in my childhood life. In my childhood life, I remember one time that I went to build a bear. In my adult life, I have gone three times. Because it was expensive and your mother couldn't afford it at the time. Uh, oh yeah, I also, to add to the Build-A-Bear collection, I don't have it with me. It's actually in my mom's attic. I gotta get it out of there at some point. Uh, I have, like, a ton of plushies still in my mom's attic. Uh, but I made a Pumbaa Build-A-Bear back when the, the, the new Lion King movie came out ages ago. Uh, the one that's, like, realistic looking. Um, but I, I made a Pumbaa Build-A-Bear and put him in a rainbow tutu. And I named him Pumbet as the female version. But I still call him Pumba. He's just wearing a rainbow tutu. Um. Anyways. Anyways. A little bit of lore. A little bit of lore into my personality and character and what I do when I make Build-A-Bears. That's like a tradition that me and my friend group have. Whenever we do a meetup, because it's an online friend group, whenever we do a meetup, we go to Build-A-Bear and we all make Build-A-Bears together. And we all... Just laugh, make terrible jokes. Like, my friend Zine, he's got a green Build-A-Bear frog that is wearing, like, boxer briefs. Uh, and you can do custom sounds. You can record custom sounds. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the meme a while ago. I think it was a... I think... I don't know where it was from. Maybe TikTok or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm chronically not on the internet. Um... But it was uh, pissing all by yourself, handsome. Um, that audio, he recorded that onto a build of air squeeze. So whenever you squeeze the hand, it said pissing all by yourself, handsome. And that had become the running joke the entire trip. Is every time somebody went to the bathroom, somebody would grab that build of air, sneak it over there, and just press the button. And it was really loud. Um. The people at the Build-A-Bear store thought it was hilarious. There were no kids in the store when we were doing it, so... Uh, they all said it wasn't the worst thing they've ever heard being put on a Build-A-Bear sound. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, Toothless is joining us for the next chapter. We are now on to chapter 15 of Empire of Storms. <clears throat> the sea seemed to pause... Aelin tugged the word key from her jacket, letting it rest between her breasts as she took a seat on the overhanging lip of the stone and peered out into the night-veiled sea and waited. 
The sliver of crescent moon was beginning to descend when a deep male voice said behind her, You look younger than I thought. Aelin stared at the sea, even as her stomach tightened. But just as good looking, right? She did not hear any footsteps, but the voice was definitely closer as he said, At least my daughter was right about your humility. Funny, she never implied you had a sense of humor. A whisper of wind to her right, then long, muscled legs beneath ancient armor appeared beside hers, sandaled feet dangling into the surf. She finally dared to turn her head, finding that armor continued to a powerful male body and a broad-boned, handsome face. He might have fooled anyone into thinking he was flesh and blood, were it not for the pale glimmer of blue light along his edges. Aelin bowed her head slightly to Brannon. A half-smile was his only acknowledgement, his red-gold hair shifting in the moonlight. A brutal but efficient battle, he said. She shrugged. I was told to come to this temple. I found it occupied. So I unoccupied it. You're welcome. His lips twitched toward a smile. I cannot stay long. But you're going to manage to cram in as many cryptic warnings as you can, right? Brandon's brows rose, his brandy-colored eyes crinkling with amusement. I had my friend send you a message to come for a reason, you know. Oh, I'm sure of it. She wouldn't have risked reclaiming the temple otherwise. But first, tell me about Maeve. She had enough of waiting until they dumped their message into her lap. She had her own God's damned questions. Brandon's mouth tightened. Specify what you need to know. Can she be killed? The king's head whipped toward her. She is old, heir of Terrison. She was old when I was a child. Her plans are far-reaching. I know, I know. But will she die if I shove a blade into her heart? Cut off her head? A pause. I don't know. What? Brandon shook his head. I don't know. All Fay may be killed. Yet she has outlived even our extended lifespans, and her power. No one really understands her power. But you journeyed with her to get the keys back. I do not know, but she long feared my flame, and yours. She's not Volg, is she? A low laugh. No, as cold as one. But no. Brandon's edges began to blur a bit. But he saw the question in her eyes, and nodded for her to go on. Aelin swallowed, her jaw clenching a bit as she forced out a breath. Does the power ever get easier to handle? Brandon's gaze softened a fraction. Yes, and no. How it impacts your relationships with those around you becomes harder than managing the power. Yet it's tied to it as well. Magic is no easy gift in any form, yet fire. We burn not just within our magic, but also in our very souls. For better or worse. His attention flicked to Goldrin, peeking over her shoulder, and he laughed in quiet surprise. Is the beast in the cave dead? No, but he told me that he misses you, and you should pay him a visit. He's lonely out there. Brannon chuckled again. We would have fun together, you and I. I'm starting to wish they'd sent you to deal with me instead of your daughter. The sense of humor must skip a generation. Perhaps it was the wrong thing to say, for that sense of humor instantly faded from that beautiful tan face, those brandy eyes going cold and hard. Brandon gripped her hand, but his fingers went through hers, right down to the stone itself. The lock, heir of Terrison. I summon you here for it. In the stone marshes there lies a sunken city. The lock is hidden there. It is needed to bind the keys back into the broken word gate. It is the only way to get them back into that gate and seal it permanently. My daughter begs you. What lock? Find the lock. Where in the stone marshes? It's not exactly a small... Brandon was gone. Aelin scowled and shoved the amulet of Orinth back into her shirt. Of course there's a god's damned lock, she muttered. She groaned a bit as she eased to her feet and frowned at the night-dark sea crashing mere yards away, at the ancient queen across it, readying for Armada. Aelin stuck out her tongue. 
Well, if Maeve wasn't already poised to attack, that'll certainly set her off. Adian drawled from the shadows of a nearby pillar. Aelin stiffened, hissing. Her cousin grinned at her, his teeth moon white. You think I didn't know you had something else up your sleeve for why we took back this temple? Or that this spring in Rifthold taught me nothing about your tendency to be planning a few things at once? She rolled her eyes, stepping off the sacred stone and stomping down the stairs. I assume you heard everything. Brandon even winked at me before he vanished. She clenched her jaw. Adian leaned his shoulder against the carved pillar. A lock, eh? And when, precisely, were you going to inform us about this new shift in direction? She stalked up to him. When I running felt like it, that's when. And if it's not the shift in direction, and it's not a shift in direction, not yet. Allies remain our goal, not cryptic commands from dead royals. Adian just smiled. A ripple in the murky shadows of the temple snagged her attention. And Aelin heaved a sigh. You two are honestly insufferable. Lysander flapped onto the top of a nearby statue and clicked her beak rather saucily. Adian slid an arm around Aelin's shoulders, guiding her back toward the ramshackle residence within the compound. New court, new traditions, you said, even for you, starting with fewer schemes and secrets that take years off my life every time you do a grand reveal. Though I certainly enjoyed that new trick with the ash. Very artistic. Aelin jabbed him in the side. Do not! The words halted as footsteps crunched on the dry earth from the nearby courtyard. The wind drifted by, carrying a scent they knew too well. Vald. A powerful one if he'd walked through her wall of flame. Aelin drew Goldrin as Adian's own blade whined softly, the sort of orange gleaming like freshly forged steel in moonlight. Lysandra remained aloft, ducking deeper into the shadows. Sold out or shit poor luck, Adian murmured. Likely both, Aelin muttered back as she, the figure appeared through, the, through two pillars. He was stocky, slightly overweight, not at all the impossible beauty that the Vogue princes preferred when inhabiting a human body. But the inhuman rake, even with that collar on his wide neck, so much stronger than usual. Of course, Brandon couldn't have bothered to warn her. The Vogue stepped into the light of the sacred bra braziers. The thoughts eddied from her head as she saw his face, and Aelin knew that Adian had been right. Her actions tonight had sent a message, an outright declaration of her location. Erewhon had been waiting for this meeting far longer than a few hours, and the Vol King knew both sides of her history, for it was the chief overseer of Indovie who now grinned at them. She still dreamt of him, of that ruddy common face leering at her, at the other women in Indovie, of his laughter when she was stripped to the waist and whipped in the open, then left to hang from her shackles in the bitter cold and or blazing sun, of his smile as she was shoved into those lightless pits, the grin still stretching wide when they removed her from them days or weeks later. Goldrin's hilt became slimy in her hand. Flame instantly burned along the fingers of her other. She cursed Lorcan for stealing back the golden ring, for taking away that one bit of immunity, of redemption. Adian was glancing between them, reading the recognition in her eyes. The overseer of Indovie sneered at her. Aren't you going to introduce us, slave? The utter stillness that crept over her cousin's face told her enough about what he'd pieced together, along with the glance at the faint scars on her wrists where shackles had been. Adian slid a step between them, no doubt reading every sound and shadow and scent to see if the man was alone, estimating how hard and long they'd have to fight their way out of here. Lysandra flapped to another pillar, poised to shift and pounce at a single word. Aelin tried to rally the swagger that had shielded and bluffed her way out of everything. But all she saw was the man di dragging those women behind the buildings. All she heard was the slam of that iron grate over her lightless pit. All she smelled were the salt and the blood and the unwashed bodies. All she felt was the burning, wet slide of blood down her ravaged back. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. 
Have they run out of pretty boys in the kingdom for you to wear? Adian drawled, buying them time to figure out the odds. Come a bit closer, the overseer smirked, and we'll see if you make a better fit, general. Adian let out a low chuckle, the sword of Orinth lifting a bit higher. I don't think you'd walk away from it. And it was the sight of that blade, her father's blade, the blade of her people. Aelin lifted her chin, and the flames encircling her left hand flickered brighter. The overseer's watery blue eyes slid to hers, narrowing with amusement. Too bad you didn't have that little gift when I put you in those pits, or when I painted the earth with your blood. A low snarl was Adian's answer, but Aelin made herself smile. It's late. I just trounced your soldiers. Let's get this chit-chat out of the way so I can have some rest. The overseer's lip curled. You'll learn proper manners soon enough, girl. All of you will. The amulet between her breasts seemed to grumble, a flicker of raw, ancient power. Aelin ignored it, shutting out any thought of it. If the Vogue, if Erewhon got one whiff of, the, of what she possessed... Uh, one whiff that she possessed what he so desperately sought. The overseer again opened his mouth. She attacked. Fire blasted him into the nearest wall, surging down his throat, through his ears, up his nose. Flame that did not burn. Flame that was mere light, blindingly white. The overseer roared, thrashing as her magic swept into him, melded with him. But there was nothing inside to grab onto. No darkness to burn out, no remaining ember to breathe life into, only. Aelin reeled back, magic vanishing and knees buckling as if struck. Her head gave a throb and nausea roiled in her gut. She knew that feeling, that taste, iron, as if the man's core was made of it, and that oily, hideous aftertaste, wordstone. The demon inside the overseer lit out a choked laugh. What are collars and rings compared to a solid heart? A heart of iron and wordstone to replace the coward's heart beating within. Why? she breathed. I was planted here to demonstrate what is waiting should you and your court visit Morath. Aelin slammed her fire into him, scouring his insides, striking that core of pure darkness inside. Again. 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 The overseer kept roaring, but Aelin kept attacking until she vomited all over the stones between them. Adian hauled her upright. Aelin lifted her head. She'd burned off his clothes, but not touched the skin. And there, pulsing against his ribs as if it were a fist punching through, was his heart. It slammed into his skin, stretching bone and flesh. Aelin flinched back. Adian drew, threw a hand in her path as the overseer arched in agony, his mouth open in a silent scream. Lysandra flapped down from the rafters, shifting into leopard form at her, their side and snarling. Again, that fist struck from inside, and then bones snapped, punching outward, ripping through muscle and skin as if his chest's cavity were the petals of a blooming flower. There was nothing inside him. No blood. No organs. Only a mighty, ageless darkness and two flickering golden embers at its core. Not embers. Eyes. Simmering with ancient malice, they narrowed in acknowledgement and pleasure. It took every ounce of her fire to steal her spine, to tilt her head at a jaunty angle and draw. At least you know how to make a good entrance, Erewhon. And that was chapter 15 of Empire of Storms. You know what? We'll keep we'll keep Toothless here for the rest of this stream. There's only about half an hour left. You know, we might we might dip into Tower of Dawn today. We'll have to see what how long the next Tower of Dawn chapter is, because this one's only a couple pages. If the next Tower of Dawn chapter is like super long, then we might call it a little early. Also, 
Thank you for the hydrate. I needed a second second sip after that chapter. <clears throat> uh, no more shrimp gaming. Oh, you're making me sit up. Although it doesn't really apply to this stream because we're not gaming. Oh well. Oh, I gotta write down the timestamp. That would have been bad. <sighs> there we go. We're sitting up straighter. We got this. Chapter 16. The overseer spoke, but the voice was not his, and the voice was not Parrington's. It was a new voice, an old voice, a voice from a different world and lifetime, a voice that fed on screams and blood and pain. Her magic thrashed against the sound, and even Adian swore softly, still trying to herd her behind him. But Aelin stood fast against the darkness, peering at them from the man's cracked chest. And she knew that even if his body hadn't been irreparably broken, there was nothing left inside him to save anyway. Nothing worth saving to begin with. She flexed her fingers at her sides, rallying her magic against the darkness that coiled and swirled inside the man's shattered chest. Erewhon said, I would think the gratitude is in order, heir of Brannon. She flicked her brows up, tasting smoke in her mouth. Easy, she murmured to her magic. Careful. She'd have to be so careful he did not see the amulet around her neck, since the presence of the final word key inside. With the first two already in his possession, if Erewhon suspected that the third key was in his, this temple, and that his utter dominance over this land and all others was close enough to grab, she had to keep him distracted. So Aelin snorted. Why should I thank you exactly? The embers of eyes slid upward, as if surveying the hollow body of the overseer. For this small warning present, for ridding the world of one more bit of vermin. And for making you realize how fruitless standing against me will be. That voice whispered right into her skull. She slammed fire outward in a blind maneuver, stumbling back into Adian at the caress of the, in that hideous, beautiful voice. From her cousin's pale face, she knew he'd heard it too, felt its violating touch. Erwan chuckled. I'm surprised you tried to save him first, given what he did to you at Endovier. My prince could scarcely stand to be inside his mind. It was already so vile. Do you find pleasure in deciding who shall be saved and who is beyond it? So easy to become a little burning god. Nausea, true and cold, struck her. But it was Adian who smirked. I think you'd have better things to do, Erewhon, than taunt us in the dead hours of the morning. Or is this all just a way to make yourself feel better about Dorian Havilliard slipping through your nets? The darkness hissed. Adian squeezed her shoulder in silent warding. End it now, before Erewhon might strike, before he could sense that the word key he sought was mere feet away. So Aelin inclined her head to the four staring at them through flesh and bone. I suggest you rest and gather your strength, Erewhon. She purred, winking at him with every shred of bravado left in her. You're going to need it. A low laugh as flames started to flicker in her eyes, heating her blood with welcome, delicious warmth. Indeed, especially considering the plans I have for the would-be king of Adderlin. Aelin's heart stopped. Perhaps you should have told your lover to disguise himself before he snatched Dorian Havilliard out of Rifthold. Those eyes narrowed to slits. What was his name? Oh, yes, Erewhon breathed as if someone had whispered it to him. Prince Rowan Whitethorn of Dorinel. What a prize he shall be. Aelin plummeted down into fire and darkness, refusing to yield one inch to the terror creeping over her. Erewhon crooned. My hunters are already tracking them. 
and I am going to hurt them, Aelin Galathinius. I am going to hone them into my most loyal generals, starting with your fey prince. A battering ram of hottest blue flamed into that pit in the man's chest cavity, into those burning eyes. Aelin kept her magic focused on that chest, on the bones and flesh melting away, leaving only that heart of iron and wordstone untouched. Her magic flowed around it like a stream surging past a rock, burning his body, that thing inside him. Don't bother saving any part of him, Adian snarled softly. Her magic roaring out of her, Aelin glanced over a shoulder. Lysander was now in human form beside Adian, teeth gritted at the overseer. The look cost her. She heard Adian's shout before she felt Erewhon's punch of darkness crash into her chest. Felt the air snap against her as she was hurled back. Felt her body bark against the stone wall before the agony of that darkness really sank in. Her breath stalled. Her blood halted. Get up, get up, get up! Erewhon laughed softly as Adian was instantly at her side, dragging her to her feet as her, her mind, her body tried to reorder itself. Aelin threw out her power again, letting Adian believe she allowed him to hold her upright simply because she forgot to step away. Not because her knees were shaking so violently she wasn't sure she could stand. But her hand remained steady at least, as she extended it. The temple around them shuddered at the force of the power she hurled out of herself. Dust and kernels of debris trickled from the ceiling high above. Columns swayed like drunken friends. Adian's and Lysandra's faces glowed in the blue light of her flame. Their features wide-eyed but set with solid determination and wrath. She leaned farther into Adian as her magic roared from her, his grip tightening at her waist. Each heartbeat was a lifetime. Each breath ached. But the overseer's body at last ripped apart under her power, the dark shields around it yielding to her. And some small part of her realized that it only did so when Erewhon deigned to leave, those amused, ember-like eyes guttering into nothing. When the man's body was only ashes, Aelin reeled back her magic, cocooned her heart in it. She gripped Adian's arm, trying not to breathe too loudly, lest he hear the rasp of her battered lungs, realize how hard that single plume of darkness had hit. A heavy thud echoed through the silent temple as the lump of iron and wordstone fell. That was the cost, Erewhon's plan. Thank you! Bless you. To realize that the only mercy she might offer her court would be death. If they were ever captured, He'd make her watch as they were all carved apart and filled with his power, make her look into their faces when he'd finished and find no trace of their souls within. Then he'd get to work on her. And Rowan and Dorian. If Erewhon was hunting him, hunting them at this very moment, if he learned that they were in Skull's Bay and now hard, and how hard he'd actually struck her. Aelin's flames banked to a quiet ember and she finally found enough strength in her legs to push away from Adian's grip. We need to be on that ship before dawn, Aelin, he said. If Erewhon wasn't bluffing. Aelin only nodded. They had to get to Skull's Bay as fast as the winds and currents could carry them. But as she turned toward the archway out of the temple, heading for the archive, she glanced at her chest, utterly untouched. Though Erewhon's power had hit her like a hurled spear. He'd missed. By three inches, Erewhon had narrowly missed hitting the amulet, and possibly sensing the word key inside it. Yet the blow still reverberated against her bones in brutal ripples. A reminder that she might be the heir of fire. But Erewhon was king of the darkness. And that was chapter 16 of Empire of Storms. Let's see, how long is the next chapter in Tower of Dawn? Mm. 
I think I've got one more chapter in me. think we can make it through this chapter. It might be a tiny bit past time. But um, I don't think it's going to be too hard. Also, thank you everybody for the bless yous in chat. And also, hello Marnie. So let's get a drink of water, write down the time, and power through this last chapter. Um, also, for anybody reading along, we are switching over to chapter 11 of Power of Dawn now, so make sure you get your Tower of Dawn books out. Hi, Chaz! Thank you, Chaz. Chapter 11 of Tower of Dawn Irene was late. Kale had come to expect her at ten, though she had given no indication of when she might arrive. Nesrin had left well before he'd awoken to seek out Sartak and his rook, leaving him here to bathe and wait and wait. An hour in, Kale began going through what exercises he could manage on his own. Unable to stand the silence, the heavy heat, the endless trickle of water from the fountain outside, the thoughts that kept sliding back to Dorian, wondering where his king was now headed. She'd ma mentioned exercises, some involving his legs. However, she'd managed to accomplish that. But if Irene didn't bother to arrive on time, then he certain w certainly wouldn't bother to wait for her. His arms were trembling by the time the clock on the sideboard chimed noon. Little silver bells atop the carved wood piece filling the space with clear, bright ringing. Sweat slid down his chest, his spine, his face as he managed to haul himself into his chair, arms trembling with the effort. He was about to call for Kaja to bring him a jug of water and a cool cloth when Irene appeared. In the sitting room, he listened as she entered the main door, then halted. She said to Kaja, waiting in the foyer, I have a matter of discretion that I need you to personally oversee. Obedient silence. Lord Westfall requires a tonic for a rash developing on his legs, likely from some oil you dumped into his bath. The words were calm, yet edged. He frowned down at his legs. He'd seen no such thing this morning, but he certainly couldn't sense an itch or burning. I need willow bark, honey, and mint. The kitchens will have them. Tell no one why. I don't want word getting around. Silence again, then a door closing. He watched the open doors to the sitting room, listening to her listen to Kaja leaving. Then her heavy sigh. Irene emerged a moment later. She looked like hell. What's wrong? The words were out before he could consider the fact that he had no right to ask such things. But Irene's golden brown face was ashen, her eyes smudged with purple, her hair limp. She only said, You exercised. Kaol glanced down at his sweat-soaked shirt. It seemed as good a way to pass the time as anything else. Each of her steps toward the desk was slow, heavy. He repeated, What's wrong? But she reached the desk and kept her back to him. He ground his teeth, debating wheeling the chair over just so, she, just so he could see her face, as he might have once stormed over to see to push into her space until she told him what the hell hap had happened. Irene just set her satchel on the desk with a thud. If you wish to exercise, perhaps a better place for it would be the barracks. A wry look at the carpet. Rather than sweating all over the Kagan's priceless rugs. His hands clenched at his sides. No, was all he said. All he could say. She lifted a brow. You were captain of the guard, weren't you? Perhaps training with the palace guard will be beneficial to- No. She peered over her shoulder, those golden eyes sizing him up. He didn't balk, even as the still shredded thing in his chest seemed to twist and rend itself further. He had no doubt she marked it. No doubt she tucked away that bit of information. Some small part of him hated her for it. Hated himself for revealing that wound through his ob obstinance. 
But Irene only turned from the desk and strode toward him, face unreadable. I apologize if rumor now gets out that you have an unfortunate rash on your legs. That usual sure-footed grace had been replaced by trudging feet. If Kaja is as smart as I think she is, she'll worry that the rash being a result of her administrations would get her in trouble and not tell anyone. Or at least realize that if word gets out, we'll know she was the only one who told of it. Fine. She still didn't want to answer his question. So he instead asked, Why did you want Kaja gone? Irene slumped onto the golden sofa and rubbed her temples. Because someone killed a healer in the library last night, and then hunted me, too. Kale went still. What? He glanced to the windows, the open garden doors, the exits. Nothing but heat and gurgling water and birdsong. I was reading about what you told me, Irene said, the freckles on her face so stark against her wan skin. And I felt someone approaching. Who? I don't know. I didn't see them. The healer. I found her as I fled. Her throat bobbed. We cleared the library from top to bottom once she was retrieved, but found no one. She shook her head, jaw tight. I'm sorry, he said, and meant it. Not just for the loss of life, but also for what seemed like the loss of a long-held peace and serenity. But he asked because he could do more, no more stop himself from getting answers, from assessing the risks, than he could halt his own breathing. What manner of injuries? Half of him didn't want to know. Irene leaned back against the sofa cushions, the down stuffing sighing as she stared at it, the gilded ceiling. I'd seen her before in passing. She was young, a little older than me, and when I found her on the floor, she looked like a long, desiccated corpse. No blood, no sign of injury, just drained. His heart stumbled at the too familiar description. Vald. He but all he had left. He bet everything on it. And whoever did this just left her body there? A nod. Her hands shook as she dragged them through her hair, closing her eyes. I think they realized they'd attacked the wrong person and moved away quickly. Why? She turned her head, opening her eyes. Exhaustion lay there, and utter fear. She looks, looked like me, Irene rasped. Our builds, our coloring, whoever it was, I think they were looking for me. Why? He asked again, scrambling to sort through all she'd said. Because what I was reading last night about the potential source of the power that injured you. I left some books about it on the table, and when the guards searched the area, the books were gone. She swallowed again. Who knew you were coming here? Kale's blood chilled despite the heat. We did not make it a secret. It was instinct to rest his hand on a sword that was not there, a sword he had chucked into the Avery months ago. It wasn't announced, but anyone could have learned long before we set foot here. It was happening again, here. A Vogue demon had come to Antica, an underling at best, a prince at worst. It could be either. The attack Irene had described fit Aelin's account of the remains she and Rowan had found from the Vogue prince's victims in Wendelin. People teeming with life turned to husks as if the Vogue drank their very souls. He found himself saying quietly, Prince Caution suspects Tumaloon was killed. Irene sat up, any lingering color draining from her face. Tumaloon's body was not drained. Hafiza, the healer on high herself, declared it was a suicide. There was, of course, a chance the two deaths weren't connected. A chance that Caution was wrong about Tumaloon. Part of Kale prayed it was so. But even if they were unrelated, what had happened last night? You need to warn the Kagan, Irene said, seeming to read his mind. He nodded. Of course. Of course I will. Damned as the entire situation was. Perhaps it was the inn he'd been waiting for with the Kagan. But he studied her haggard face, the fear there. I'm sorry to have brought you into this. Has security been increased around the Torre? Yes. A breathy push of sound. She scrubbed at her face. And you? Did you come here under guard? She threw him a frown. In plain daylight? In the middle of the city? Kale crossed his arms. I would put nothing past the vault. She waved a hand. I won't be heading alone into any dark corridors anytime soon. 
None of us in the Torre will. Guards have been called in, stationed down every hall, in every few feet of the library. I don't even know where Hafiza had summoned them from. Bog underlings could take bodies of anyone they wished, but the princes were vain enough that Kale doubted they'd bother to take the form of a lowly guard, not when they preferred beautiful young men. A collar and a dead, cold smile flashed before his eyes. Kale blew out a breath. I am truly sorry about the healer, especially if his being here had somehow triggered this attack. If they pursued Irene only because of her helping him, he added. You should be on your guard, constantly. She ignored the warning and scanned the room, the carpets, and the lush palms. The girls, the young acolytes, they're frightened. And you? Before he would have volunteered to stand watch, to guard her door, to organize the soldiers because he knew how these things operated. But he was no captain, and he doubted the Kagan or his men would be inclined to listen to a foreign lord anyway. But he couldn't stop himself, that part of him, as he asked, What can I do to help? Irene's eyes shifted toward him, assessing, weighing. Not him, but he had the feeling it was something inside herself. So he kept still, kept his gaze steady while she looked inward. While she at last took a breath and said, I teach a class once a week. After last night, they were all too tired, so I let them sleep instead. Tonight, we have a vigil for the healer who, who died, but tomorrow. She chewed on her lip, again debating for a heartbeat before she added, I should like you to come. What sort of class? Irene toyed with a heavy curl. There is no tuition for students here, but we pay our way in other forms. Some help with the cooking, the laundry, the cleaning. But when I came, Hafiza, I told her I was good at all those things. I'd done them for a while. She asked me what else I knew beyond healing, and I told her. She bit her lip. Someone once taught me self-defense, what to do against attackers, usually the male kind. It was an effort not to lick the scar across her throat, not to wonder if she had learned it after, or if even that had not been enough. Irene sighed through her nose. I told Hafiza that I knew a little about it, and that I had made a promise to someone, to the person who taught me, to show and teach it to as many women as possible. So I have. Once a week, I teach the acolytes along with any older students, healers, servants, or librarians who would like to know. This delicate, gentle-handed woman. He supposed he'd learned that strength could be hidden beneath the most unlikely faces. The girls are deeply shaken. There hasn't been an intruder in the Torre for a great while. I think it would do a long way if you were to join me tomorrow, to teach what you know. For a long moment, he stared at her, blinked. You realize I'm in this chair. And your mouth still works? Tart, crisp words. He blinked again. They might not find me the most reassuring instructor. No, they'll likely be swooning and sighing over you so much that they'll forget to be afraid. His third and final blink made her smile slightly, grimly. He wondered what that smile would look like if she ever was truly amused, happy. The scar has a touch of mystery, she said, cutting him off before he could remember the slice down his cheek. He studied her as she rose from the sofa to stride back to the desk and unpack her bag. You would truly like me to be there tomorrow? We'll have to figure out how to get you there, but it should not be so difficult. Stuffing me into a carriage will be fine. She stiffened, glancing over her shoulder. Save that anger for our training, Lord Westfall. She fished out a vial of oil and set it on the table. And you will not be taking a carriage. A litter carried by servants, then? He'd sooner crawl. A horse. Ever heard of one? He clutched the arms of his chair. You need legs to ride. So it's a good thing you still have both of them. She went back to studying whatever vials were in that bag. I spoke to my superior this morning. She has seen similarly injured people ride until they could meet with us, with special straps and braces. They are fashioning them for you in the workshops as we speak. He let those words sink in. So you assumed I would come with you tomorrow. Irene turned at last, satchel in her hand now. 
I assumed you would wish to ride regardless. He could only stare while she approached, vial in hand, only a prim sort of irritation on her face, better than the stark fear, he asked, voice a bit raw. You think such a thing is possible? I do. I'll arrive at dawn, so we have enough time to figure it out. The lesson begins at nine. To ride, even if he could not walk. Riding. Please do not give me this hope and let it crumble, he said hoarsely. Irene set the satchel and vial down on the low-lying table before the sofa and motioned him to move closer. Good healers don't do such things, Lord Westfall. He hadn't bothered with the jacket today and had left his belt in the bedroom. Sliding his sweat-soaked shirt over his head, he made quick work of unbuttoning the tops of his pants. It's Kaol, he said after a moment. My name. It's Kaol. Not Lord Westfall. He grunted as he hoisted himself from the chair onto the sofa. Lord Westfall is my father. Well, you're a lord too. Just Kaol. Lord Kaol. He shot her a look as he positioned his legs. She did not reach to help, to adjust. Here I was, thinking you still resented me. If you help my girls tomorrow, I'll reconsider. From the gleam in those golden eyes, he very much doubted that, but a half-smile tugged on his mouth. Another massage today? Please, he nearly added. His muscles already ached from his exercising and moving so much between bed and sofa and chair and bath. No, Irene gestured for him to lie face down on the sofa. I'm going to begin today. You found information on it? No, she repeated, tugging off his pants with that cool, swift efficiency. But after last night, I do not want to delay. I will, I can't, he ground his teeth. We'll find a way to protect you while you research. He hated the words, felt them curl like rancid milk on his tongue along his throat. I think they know that, she said quietly, and dabbed spots of oil along his spine. I'm not sure if it's the information, though, that they want me to keep from finding. That they want to keep me from finding. His gut tightened, even as she ran soothing hands down his back. They lingered near that splotch at his apex. What do you think they want, then? He already suspected, but he wanted to hear her say it, wanted to know if she thought the same, understood the risks as much as he did. I wonder, she said at last, if it was not just what I was researching, but also that I am healing you. He craned his head to look at her as the words settled between them. She only stared at that mark on his spine, her tired face drawn. He doubted she'd slept. If you're too tired, I am not. He clenched his jaw. You can nap here. I'll look after you. Unless useless as it would be. Then work on me later. I will work on you now. I am not going to let them scare me away. Her voice did not tremble or waver. She added, more quietly, but no less fiercely. I once lived in fear of other people. I let other people walk all over me just because I was too afraid of the consequences for refusing. I did not know how to refuse. Her hand pushed down on his spine in a silent order to rest his head again. The day I reached these shores, I cast aside that girl, and I will be damned if I let her re-emerge, or let someone tell me what to do with my life, my choices again. The hair on his arms rose at the simmering wrath in her voice. A woman made of steel and crackling embers. Heat indeed flared beneath her palm as she slid it up the column of his spine toward that splotch of white. Let's see if it enjoys being pushed around for a change, she breathed. Irene laid her hand directly atop the scar. Kaol opened his mouth to speak, but a scream came out instead. And that was chapter 11 of Tower of Dawn and where we are going to wrap up, wrap it up for tonight. Which awesomely is perfect timing as it is exactly 9 p.m. <laughs> Oh, as always, Q 
here is the guide again for your reference. So we just wrapped up chapter 11 of Tower of Dawn. Uh, I know you can't really see it because the Ko-Fi alerts are blocking it. But um, so next stream slash video, we will be starting off with chapter 12 of Tower of Dawn. And then we will be switching back to Empire of Storms for a couple chapters.